And, it had, and that name has been linked to Temple Mount for over 2,000 years. Now, if you'll allow me, I'll show you what I mean. If you approach the Temple Mount from the south side, uh, you'll come up against a broad set of stairs that have been excavated by the archaeologists in the last uh, couple of hundred years or so. But in the time of Jesus, these stairs would have been how the average Israelite would have uh, gone up to the Temple Mount to worship. So you would have gone up these stairs approaching the south wall of the Temple Mount. That's the very same huge mammoth wall you see today. It's not the west wall or the whaling wall. That's obviously around west. This is the south wall. And as you go up these broad set of stairs, there could be several thousand on those stairs at any one time. When you get to the top, there would be two entrances carved into that huge south wall. And the entrance on the left and on the right were really tunnels, and there were stairways in those tunnels. And as you ascended inside the tunnel, you would come out on the Temple Mount itself, uh, just a few feet away from the, the temple uh, itself and the court of the Gentiles. So if you look at these two gates, the one on the left, it's kind of interesting because it's just not a tunnel. It's uh, kind of ornamentalized. It's got two arches over it. It's called a double gate. And that's a sign of prominence. If you look on the right-hand side, there would be uh, three arches called a triple gate, which is a sign of prominence. And again, you can go there today and see these things. And the interesting thing about, the most interesting thing about those two gates is when you look at them, they're both named after one, obviously, great prophet of God. Both those gates. Now, I've done a little study in this area, and I can't find where there were any other gates in all of Jerusalem that were named after a prophet. Now, I could be wrong, but I haven't found any. And I don't know of any, obviously, that are associated with the Temple Mount, the, any others that are named after prophets, other than these two gates. That's kind of impressive, I think. And I would also uh, hazard a guess that less than 5% of all Christians have ever even heard of that prophet's name, much less know what that prophet might have done to deserve such recognition. Uh, do any of you know? Would you like to know? Oh, that's good. <laughs> Otherwise, we would not need to go further. Well, her name is Holda. You heard me right, ladies. Her name is Hulda. That's spelled H-U-L-D-A-H. -H. And she was raised up at a difficult time, a crisis time, in the, uh, the southern kingdom. We're going to go into this in a little bit more detail here, but I'll give you a preview. She was raised up at a particularly troublesome time, and she helped guide a very young king of Israel and turn his heart strongly towards the Lord. Now, Huldah was a true prophet and scholar of God's word, and she was someone who could be implicitly trusted with all matters of the law and also knowing the will of God, and that's a key element. Huldah spelled, like I say, H-U-L-D-A-H, and you'll find her story and King Josiah, who's the one we're going to study, uh, documented in two books of the Bible, uh, 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. 2 Kings 21 and verse 1. And it reads, Manasseh. Now, Manasseh is the son of Hezekiah. Now, Manasseh's name in Hebrew means forgetful. And he sure was. Watch this. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hephzibah. That means my delight is in her. And no doubt Hezekiah's delight was in her. I bet she was a good mom, and Manasseh sure couldn't blame any of what he did on her, and certainly not on his father. But you notice that Manasseh ascended the throne at only 12 years of age, and notice too he reigned for 55 years. Now that's the longest of any of the kings in the line of David. That's particularly interesting when you read how bad Manasseh sinned against Yahweh. And which included not just sinning. This guy really knew how to do it right. He would even taunt Yahweh. You'll see that in a little bit. 
So we're going to see Manasseh sure did forget all that the Lord had done for his uh, father Hezekiah. If uh, Manasseh was only 12 when he became king, then that means that he was born three years after the Lord delivered Jerusalem and Hezekiah from the Assyrians and lengthened uh, Hezekiah's uh, uh, life 15 years. So he heard of all his life, he undoubtedly heard about all the miracles the Lord had done for his father, both in healing him from uh, a terminal illness and also in delivering uh, Jerusalem. And yet he chose to ignore the message behind those miracles. Okay, verse 2. And he, that's Manasseh, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So when Yahweh told Israel to utterly cast out the heathen occupiers of the promised land, he had also told them not to worship him the same way that the heathen did. In Deut and we're not going to turn there, but in Deuteronomy 12.30, you might make a note of that, the children of Israel, and this is true of us today, we constantly try to find ways to worship our God that aren't the way he tells us to worship him. They're the way that everybody else worships their God. They have a good time. That's what the children of Israel did at that time. They said, well, these guys really know how to worship their gods. They have some great holidays. Man, some of the holidays are just terrific. I wish we could take those holidays and have them ourselves, and then we could worship Yahweh that way. And Moses told them flat out, came from the Lord, that our Heavenly Father does not want you worshiping him the way the heathen do. You can have your own holidays, but don't try to take and make them into a special way to worship him. He says that's an abomination. Verse 3, For he, that's Manasseh, built up the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal, and made a grove, as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served them. Now remember, this king is ruler over a kingdom which is chosen by God himself to be the king line to the promised Messiah. And the Bible tells us that all the hosts of heaven are really what? Angels. And while we don't have time to cover that subject for now, one of my favorite uh, lectures of Pastor Murray's is uh, called The Host. And that's tape number 530. If you've never gotten that tape, order it. Don't even think about it. Just get it. And it's so full of surprises documented from God's Word. You'll find that our Father even uses evil angels as judgments upon the uh, world. Okay, verse 4, and he, that's Manasseh again, built altars in where? The house of the Lord, of which the Lord, and when you see Lord capitalized, what's that mean in Hebrew every time? It means Yahweh, that's the sacred name, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem will I put my name. Now that's taunting God. If you want to taunt him, try putting idols directly in the house of God. And apparently this king was doing just what the people wanted because there's no evidence of any dissatisfaction. Verse 5, And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. Remember, you've got the temple and you've got the temple courts. So this old boy actually put altars for pagan gods right in the courts of the temple. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 1 and 5. Don't turn there. I wish we could, but we don't have the time commands that those kind of folks be put to death for worshiping angels, which is an abomination. And if you look around today, what do you see? A lot of New Age folks who love to talk about their special angels. It's even gone over and infected a lot of Christians. You'll find so many Christian books on angels and uh, what they are. And some of these books come pretty close to advising you how to cultivate your special angel to uh, get protection and get some of your desires in life. Now, those Christians are playing with a lot of strange fire, and they ought to study God's Word a lot closer. If you study with the Shepherd's Chapel, you'll know angels aren't any little cherubims with wings on them, little sweet things. And bad angels are, <laughs> are definitely not to play with. Verse 6, And he, that's Manasseh, listen to this, made his son pass through the fire and observe times, that's astrology, and used enchantments, that's magic, and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards, those are fortune tellers, and he wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. I mean, he, this guy, I think, knew what he was doing. He actually was bound and determined to poke his finger 
in our Heavenly Father's eyes. I don't know how else to describe it. It says he did it to provoke him to anger. Now, he even had his own son, his own flesh and blood, sacrificed to Moloch. And you probably heard Pastor Murray describe what Moloch looked like, but just in case you haven't, uh, they'd usually cast a, uh, a bronze a hollow statue of a, uh, of a god, and this god had his hands outstretched. And they'd build a fire in the belly of this thing and heat it up until it glowed. And then you either sacrificed your child and put that child on those hot arms, which would, of course, burn them up, or you put them on there live. There's, I've read two different versions of it, but everybody agrees that that's ultimately what happened is the kid was burned up in the arms of this, of this uh, tin god. It's pretty bad to take your own flesh and blood and do that. So he also used spiritualists, magicians, and fortune tellers. And of course, all those things are abomination before the Lord. And, and, then, and the Lord says you either eliminate them or not only you will be cursed, but also the land that you live in, the very land itself, you know, crops, things like that. Uh, you read that in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10. And the Lord spake by his servants the prophets, saying, now these prophets aren't named, but uh, most Bible scholars feel that Isaiah and Habakkuk were probably two of them. Now, it's my personal opinion that Huldah was also involved here, but I'll not say more on that right now, and I'll tell you why later. Verse 11, because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle, and I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down, and I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance, and I will deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a prey and a spoil to all their enemies, because they have done that which was evil in my sight, and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt, even unto this day. Verse 16, Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other, besides his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now listen carefully to that. Who do you think this innocent blood was? Well, the innocent blood happens to be the prophets that we just read back in verse 10. Now, this is something I'd really love to go into a lot more because it's well worth the study. We just don't have the time today because you really need to understand what this time was like. This Manasseh was thoroughly evil. He seduced the people to do even more evil and they would have done on their own. He provoked Yahweh directly. Josephus, in his famous works, Antiquities of the Jews, book 10, chapter 3 and verse 1, says that Manasseh had the prophet Isaiah sawn asunder. Now, while you can't find that exactly in the Bible, it could well be true, and it might be alluded to over in Hebrews. We don't have time to turn there, but make a note of it. Hebrews 11, verses 36 through 38, says that in times past, those of faith had a trial of cruel mockings, and scourging with bonds and imprisonment, and they were stoned, and they were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. That's the kind of environment that Manasseh had for those that loved the Lord. He killed them all. And the Lord, I don't think, is joking when he says he filled Jerusalem with blood from one end to the other with righteous folks. Can, now, can you imagine anything worse than that? This is a pretty bad old boy. Evil. Now, I'm going to, this is supposition again, I'll get to more reasoning later, but my hunch is that Huldah was one of those prophets that wasn't killed, obviously. She was a woman prophet of God, and maybe the reason she wasn't killed is because she was a woman. Even a lot of societies today, when you see evil forms of government, they still have a respect about women. When women 
uh, demonstrate. Men, of course, we have to we ignore the little women there. They're just, they're no bother to us. They're no threat. We don't have to worry about them. Men demonstrate do the same things. They kill them. That's what a totalitarian society do. But women can get away with a lot of things if they've got enough valor. And just keep that in the back of your uh, hat right now, and I'll tell you why I think that a little later. Now, this part of our story has got a surprise ending, and we would miss it if we stayed in 2 Kings. Now, this is kind of interesting. Have you ever wondered what's the difference between 2 King, or Kings and Chronicles? You ever asked that? You know, they seem to tell much the same story. Well, Kings, and also the book of Samuel, tells the history of God's Word through the human side. Chronicles is through the divine side, in other words, the, the rulership. It's the official records of the kings. So to get the full story of Manasseh, if we left it right now, Manasseh is one evil guy. And there's no question that he, he was evil and did the most abominable things ever. I'm going to claim that he was, if not the, he was one of the worst kings in the entire Bible. That's Manasseh. Now turn over to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. 2 Chronicles chapter 33. When you get to 2 Chronicles 33, then mosey on over to verse 10. Incidentally, the uh, Companion Bible gives those distinctions between Chronicles and Kings. So uh, if you've got a Companion Bible, you'll see lots of good notes there uh, about the differences of those uh, books. Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 10, and it reads, And the Lord, again it's capitalized, remember that's always Yahweh, spake to Manasseh and to his people. Now how did he speak to Manasseh and to his people? Well, as we read over in Kings, through his prophets. But they would not hearken. Wherefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now you kind of get the picture. It sounds like they came down, Manasseh ran, ran, or ran off and hid in the bushes somewhere. And they reached in there amongst the thorns and pulled him out, bound him, and hauled him off to Babylon. Now remember, Babylon was a vassal nation of the Assyrians, but it's where they, uh, they took uh, Manasseh off to put him in prison. But now an absolutely incredible thing happens. Verse 12, And when he, that's Manasseh, was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. This boy was repentant. And prayed to him, and he, that's the Lord, was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, he heard his prayers, and brought him again to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Now here's Manasseh, probably the most evil king in the history of of certainly the southern kingdom, he actually repented of his past sins, and the Lord heard this truly repentant king and caused the Assyrians to take him out of prison, and they didn't do that very often, friends, if you read Assyrian history, and put him back in Jerusalem to his throne. You stop and think about Manasseh for a second. No matter what you think you've done in your life, you haven't even begun to know how to sin like Manasseh did. He killed God's prophets right and left. He made the sin. He made other people to sin more than they ever would have done on their own. And yet, he repented. And the Lord heard it because the Lord, you know, sure, you could be in jail and you can say, well, I sure am sorry I'm here. I wish I hadn't done that. But it was more than that. You read it close. He was repentant. The Lord judges your heart and not your flesh. We can all be thankful of that. I can't take too much close judgment. I don't like for him to judge my heart myself. Now, verse 14, after this, he, that's Manasseh, built a wall without the city of David on the west side of the Gahan, that's where the springs were on the east side of Jerusalem in the, and down the valley between the uh, uh, Mount of Olives and uh, the uh, Jerusalem Mount itself, the Temple Mount, even until the entering at the fish gate, and that's over on the other side, on the west side, and encompassed about Ophel and raised it to a very great height and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. And he, that's Manasseh, took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord. Remember, that's the Asherah idol, the fertility idol. 
out of the house of the Lord and all of the idols that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem, and he cast them, threw them out of the city. That's Manasseh. And he repaired the altar of the Lord because it hadn't been used in a long, long time. We're talking decades here, friends. And sacrificed there on peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord, Yahweh, their God only. So notice Manasseh, he took down all these idol worshiping places, dismantled them, threw them away, which is a little different from destroying them, as we'll see. And he allowed the people to still go back to those same old places where the idols used to be, and they would go there and sacrifice this time not to a pagan god, they would sacrifice to Yahweh at these old pagan altars, which of course is illegal. Worshiping God in the wrong way. But at least as far as Manasseh is concerned, you can't deny his heart was right, he was truly repentant, the old boy made a 180 degree turn and he acted publicly on that repentance. Now the rest of the acts, this is verse 18, now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers that spake to him in the name of God, or the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. His prayer, that's Manasseh's prayer also, and how God was entreated of him and all his sin and his trespass and the places wherein he built high places and set up groves and graven images before he was humbled, behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. That just means prophets. So Manasseh slept with his fathers, and they buried him in his own house, and Ammon his son reigned in his stead. Now let's pause here for a second. The writer says that a prayer, the prayer that Manasseh prayed, is written in the book of the kings of Israel. Well, it's not in the book of Chronicles, and it's not in the book of Kings. But you know what a prayer that must have been. Here's an old boy who's locked up in prison in Babylon, no hope of ever getting out of there, fear for his life, and he trusts the Lord, he repents, he asks the Lord for forgiveness. Wouldn't that have been an interesting prayer to have read? It says it was written down. Wouldn't that be a good prayer for a lot of folks today that think it's over for me? I've sinned so much. It's hopeless. The Lord will never forgive me for what I've done. That's what a lot of people think. Incidentally, Pastor Murray's got a tape uh, called Forgiveness. It's a terrific study. If you've never gotten that study, I'll guarantee you, you won't stop listening to it until it's over. But here's a guy who really understood forgiveness. Wouldn't you like to have been able to read his prayer? Wouldn't you? Well... If you got an Apocrypha by good speed, believe it or not, you got the prayer. When the Lord says something's written down in the books of the kings, he's not just joking. Now, before we get all kinds of uh, letters and phone calls, I guess, let me say that uh, I'm not saying the Apocrypha's inspired, and neither is Pastor Murray, uh, but we are saying that the Apocrypha contains a lot of things of historical interest and a lot of prophetical things for serious Bible students. And this Apocrypha was a part of all English language Bibles since, uh, since 1362 and all the way up in this King James 1611 Bible. That's a great Bible to get a copy of, the original 1611 uh, that the chapel offers. is one of the reasons why it's offered is not so you can read it, but it's offered so that you can see that, uh, among other things, the Apocrypha was inside the 1611 Bible as it was published uh, originally. And also the Apocrypha was found in most Greek translations of the uh, Old uh, Testament. But in 1827, the uh, British Bible Society decided to take it out. And pretty soon thereafter, the American Bible Society did likewise. So after those times, well, you found this being deleted. But the chapel offers the Apocrypha, and I don't have time to read it, but there's a book in here called, aptly enough, The Prayer of Manasseh. And it's only about a page and a half. And I'll guarantee you that is one moving prayer. At least it did me. And I wish we had time for it, but 
uh, when you make it a side study, uh, get an Apocrypha and read that prayer. Now, Manasseh found God. Surely, Manasseh's son Ammon is going to be an okay fellow, right? I mean, you know, Hezekiah was, was okay, and Manasseh turned out awful. He was the most evil king I can read about. I think he even rivals Ahab. But uh, he had a son Ammon, and you can better believe Ammon must have heard all about what his father did and how his father was forgiven and returned back to his throne. And Ammon in the, uh, in the uh, Hebrew means builder. So we'll find out what, uh, what he builds. So we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 33 and verse 21. Ammon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he, that's Ammon again, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father, for Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. And he humbled himself not before the Lord, as Manasseh his father had humbled himself, but Ammon trespassed more and more. And his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. This old boy only reigned two years. He went, remember, Manasseh didn't destroy. He, he took down, dismantled all the idols and altars and cast them out of the city. I guess Ammon and his folks went around and picked them up, brought them back in and put them back. Now they could quit sacrificing to Yahweh illegally. They could sacrifice their pagan gods. That's apparently what he did. Didn't learn a thing. So whatever else he did, he must have offended his own staff because they conspired to kill him. And, of course, they were hoping that the people would understand their action. But as uh, verse 34, I mean, as verse uh, 25 said, but the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah, and Josiah means whom God heals, his son in his stead. So that's enough said about Ammon. Now we're finally getting, we've laid all this foundational work so you can see what the shape the land was in, what the people were doing, which was very evil. Now we finally get around to uh, King uh, Josiah. And uh, we'll go on now to verse uh, chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Now think about that. That's why I want to know what the youngest kid up here in the, in the uh, children's choir was. Because most of the, the children in the children's choir are older than Josiah was when he began to reign as king. Now, I'm sure he had a lot of folks around, you know, obviously as guidance for him. But that's very young. And he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he, as Josiah did that which, uh, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor the left. In other words, he was straight arrow right from a very young age. So if you've ever thought that children are too young to understand God's word, maybe you better think again. For in the eighth year of his, that's Josiah's reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after God, the God of David, his father, and in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the moten images. So at just 16 years of age, Josiah began to earnestly seek after the one true God. And at 20 years of age, Josiah began to tear down all the places of idolatry. And don't you just know the Heavenly Father was proud of him? Verse 4, and they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence. So he was right there. He just didn't command to see it done. And you're going to see later on, too, he stood right there while they broke them down. Uh, that were high above them, he cut down in the groves and the carved images and the moten images. He break in pieces. So he didn't just didn't cast them out of the city. Josiah knew what to do with them. He break them in pieces. He made dust out of them. And he strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. So he took all this dust. He went out there to the graveyard and he strewed it all over those evil people that had in generations past, he'd worshiped these things and died. He strode all that dust right over them. Their gods didn't save them. And he burnt the bones of the priest upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. Now, he didn't kill the priest, but 
uh, elsewhere in Kings, you'll find out that he dug these old priests up. These are these idolatrous priests that had died. He went and had them dug up, and he took them and burned them on their own altar uh, to uh, you know, obviously not cleanse the altar, to make it unclean. And verse 6, And he did so in the cities of uh, Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even to Naphtali, with their mattocks, mattocks a sharp sword, round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten down the graven images into powder and cut down all the altars throughout all the land of Israel, then he returned back to Jerusalem. So notice he goes outside of the southern kingdom. He goes up into the northern kingdom where old Jeroboam had set up a lot of these pagan altars and he proceeded to tear all those down, make them, tear them up into dust. Verse 8. Now in the 18th year of his reign, so he's just 26 years of age, when he had purged the land and the house, that's the house of the Lord he's speaking of there, which was in a terrible state of repair. This temple had not been used probably, or certainly no tax money, or not tax money, but no, uh, none of the people's money went towards it uh, for generations, long time. He sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah and Messiah, the governor of the city, that's the governor of Jerusalem, and Joha, the son of Joaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord. Uh, Shaphan means rock badger. Not, I don't have any uh, insight as to what that uh, might mean. Uh, he was the son of uh, Azaliah, which means reserved of Yah. So our Heavenly Father always keeps his election where he needs him. He always has him around. Uh, that Masiah means the work of Yah. And uh, Joha means the brother related to Yah. And the son of Johaz is Yah his breath. So you see a lot of names there that indicate that the Lord had reserved these folks to himself. Now, Shaphan, although you can't see it here, in 2 Kings 22 3, was a state secretary. He wasn't, uh, and I'm, I mean, not a secretary, you know, but a, but a representative of the state. When he, when he traveled, he was representing his king Josiah. So he was the king's right-hand man, in other words. So with him, the king sent the governor of Jerusalem. The recorder, Joha, was probably an official record scribe, and he's, his presence was probably there because of all the money they were going to collect because they're going to repair the temple. Verse 9, And when they came to Hilkiah, Hilkiah in Hebrew means portion of Yah, the high priest. So they're coming to Hilkiah, the high priest. Now this old boy hadn't had a lot to do probably in past generations. I mean, after all, in his own... In, in his own temple there, the temple of God, they've been putting idols up in there. And all around the temple, there's idols and altars. So Hilkiah, they come to Hilkiah and they deliver the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and all of the remnant of Israel and all of Judah and Benjamin. And then they returned, uh, they returned to Jerusalem. So there were some of these remnant of the northern tribes that it also migrated down into the south because they collected money of those to repair the temple. And they put it, that's the money, in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house. Now, in the interest of time, let's skip down to verse 14 of Second Chronicles chapter 34. And it reads, And when they brought the money that was uh, brought into the house of the Lord, that's to pay the workmen for the work being done there, Hilkiah, that's the high priest, found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. This might have been in Moses' own handwriting, too. We don't know. So it would appear that the money collected for the repair of the temple was kept in a very safe place at the temple, and probably in that very safe place were these scrolls. So when he was going in there to get the money to pay the workmen, he remembers or finds these scrolls. And Hilkiah, that's the high priest, that's verse 15, and Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. Remember, Hilkiah is the high priest, so hopefully he would understand that the books of the law would need to go to the king. Why? Because Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 18, don't turn there, but Deuteronomy 17, 18, commands that a king has to write down all of the law in his own handwriting as part of the obligations of being king. That's a good way of getting the word of God into your heart if you had to sit down and write the whole word of God down in your own handwriting. So we, what we found here, we've got a book of the law, which nobody's referred to, probably didn't even know about very much, 
for generations. Verse 16, And Shaphan carried the book to the king, that's Josiah, and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was co committed to thy servants, they do it. In other words, we did everything you told us to do. Verse 17, And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it to the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. They paid the workmen for the job they're doing repairing the temple. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the high priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. It's almost like an afterthought. He said, King Josiah, we did everything you told us to do. We fixed up the temple. We paid off the folks. And oh, by the way, Hilkiah the high priest found a scroll here that uh, looks like it's a, a book of the law written by Moses. Uh, and Josiah had him read it. And this is probably the first time in at least two generations uh, the king just, that a king had ever heard the word of the Lord read to him. Probably the first time. Incidentally, that may remind you of today, because we're in a time when our political and educational systems are trying to suppress. Try it sometime in an official function. Try it in the school. Verse 19, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law, he rent his clothes. Now that's an outward sign of extreme anguish. And no doubt, Josiah had fresh on his mind the curses for disobedient to God, to being, for being disobedient to God's law that you'll find in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy 28. Now, as a king, he also would have to know, after reading the law, that he had special obligations and responsibilities to Yahweh to lead his people back to God. So he knew he couldn't afford to make any mistakes here. He's hearing the law for the very first time in his life, and he's looking at these curses that are so severe that he wants to make sure that these scrolls are legitimate. Are those curses for real? So verse 20, And the king commanded Hilkiah and Anakim, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah the servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. Now, think what's going on. Here's King Josiah, and he's talking to Hilkiah, the high priest, plus a few of his most trusted advisors, and he's saying, go out there and basically authenticate this word of God. Make sure that this is right. Are these scrolls legitimate? Are these curses for us today? Now, for about a generation, we've restricted his word from our schools while allowing blasphemy to be taught openly. And we're witnessing a diminishing number of strong Christian leaders in colleges and Congress and in schools and, most importantly, in our own churches. So don't think we're a lot different from some of the folks of this day you read. A lot of times we read these Old Testament uh, stories and think, well, we're not as bad as they are. Don't be too sure. Americans are being dumbed down by satanic forces, those powers and principalities you read of in Ephesians 6, 12. And, but our Father always keeps a few of his children around. And I want to say this from the heart, we can be thankful of Shepherd's Chapel and that the Lord's using Pastor Murray and a lot of us to be light bearers to the to the world. We have a lot of curses on us if we don't spread his word. We have an obligation. Think about that. Because we're kings also and queens of his. Second Chronicles 34, verse 22. And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went into Huldah. Ah, about time we got the old Huldah. Huldah, incidentally, in Hebrew means weasel. And everybody has a hard time with that. You know, woof. Not kind of, that's not too nice a thing to be called. You know, she's a weasel. Hmm. But I had a hard time trying to figure it out, too, until I, I got an encyclopedia out and I looked up weasel. Well, it, it turns out the weasel's a pretty intelligent critter. Uh, since then, I've also talked to a couple of farmers that tell me that weasels, they're like little stealth animals. They can get in the chicken coop at night, and they can steal eggs underneath the hen while she's sleeping. They're really slick. They're not stupid at all. They're among the most intelligent of, uh, of the animals like that. Now, I got a hunch that's a little indication of how Huldah got out from under Manasseh when Manasseh was killing all the prophets of God. She was probably the only one left standing because she was a woman, and she was probably giving him what for, and she was probably a big nuisance in his life. 
But when he was in prison, he might have remembered a lot of what old Holder was telling him. Now, I can say that because, you know, you just don't send guys like the high priest and a lot of scholars over to someone to authenticate God's word, a prophet of God, unless they really know their business. Now, I don't think she was in her 20s anything like that. I think Holda has a, is a seasoned person. Now, she had to have been alive during the time of Manasseh. And I'll bet you that woman of valor stood up for the Lord. And uh, let's see here. We got Holda means a weasel, the wife of Shalom. Uh, that most likely means peaceable, the son of Tikva, which means a measuring cord, and she's going to measure, all right. The son of Hashra, meaning lacking, and that's what she's going to find, that there's a lot of lacking. Out there. Now, her husband, Shalom, was keeper of the wardrobe. Uh, she, now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they uh, spake to her to that effect. Now, again, when you, when you read these uh, commentaries, they're great to read. You've got to look them up. They're, they'll keep you in stitches. I haven't found one yet that doesn't have an obviously difficult time dealing with the fact that all these high-ranking uh, religious and political menfolk, all representing the king, had to go to a woman... <laughs> for advice as to whether these scrolls of the law are authentic. After all, now here's why they got problems with it. The commentaries, they all say, you know, wouldn't it have made more sense for them to seek out the prophets Jeremiah or Zephaniah? Now we know those prophets were alive during some time during the reign of Josiah because the first couple of verses in each of those books, Zephaniah and Jeremiah, mentions Josiah, that they were alive during his reign. So, it really bothers these guys that, you know, these high-ranking fellas, including the high priest of all things, oh, have to go to a woman. You know, and my goodness, woman can only teach other women, right? You know, Sunday school teacher, that sort of thing. Unless you study with Shepherd's Chapel, and then you know what a real woman of God is like, it's not such a big surprise. And she's still pretty stealthy today because no one ever hears a hold of her. So she's still kind of weaseling out of the limelight there a little bit. She doesn't get near the attention she deserves, I think. But these, these uh, high muckety-mucks, they're all going over to, to uh, see Hulda. And I believe she was alive during the time of Manasseh when he was killing all the male prophets. And remember that Hebrews chapter 11, verses 36 and 38, I think you'll see where the, how the times were during Manasseh. And you'll probably see where Josephus was correct in saying that Isaiah was sawn asunder by Manasseh, pretty evil old boy, and Huldah made it through that, I believe. Anyway, I know Father wouldn't have allowed all of his prophets to be killed. Doesn't happen. He'll preserve at least one, and I kind of like to think old Huldah was one of the ones that he that uh, stood the course. Verse 23, and she, that's Huldah, answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man that sent you to me. Oh, man. Here she is using the sign of a prophet. She's saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. That's Yahweh Elohim Israel. That's the official name of, of God. You don't use that lightly. And she said, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands, Therefore, my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. Our Father's long-suffering, he's slow to anger, but he will act. And he let Judah go on for a long, long time before he took the kind of action that uh, of taking him captive into Babylon. Verse 26, And as for the king of Judah, that's Josiah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall you say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, according to the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God when thou heardest his words against this place and the, against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me and did rend thy clothes and weep before me. I have heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil I will bring upon this place and upon the inhabitants of the same. And so they brought the king word again. Now that's, I think, seven verses that mention Huldah. And if you go over to Kings, there's seven more that mention Huldah. So in the entire Bible, 
this woman prophet of God is only mentioned for a grand total of 14 verses, seven in each book. You think she had an effect, though? Well, let's see. For one thing, I think you can see Josiah was truly pierced by the word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 came to my mind that the word's a two-edged sword, and that, war, that word of the Lord will absolutely get you on the straight and narrow once you've heard it and understood it. That's why teaching the word is so important. Notice what Josiah's first act is. Verse 29 of chapter 34 of Second Chronicles. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he, that's Josiah himself, read in their ears all of the words of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. That's one reason why the Shepherd's Chapel emphasizes teaching the Word rather than on condemnation. You don't ever want to get ahead of the Word if you'll just teach it and let that sharper than a two-edged sword Word do its work. You won't have to worry about condemning people except the truly evil of the land. So you can be sure that Josiah not only had the Word read to him, I'll bet you by that time he had also written it down with his own hand so it would stay in his heart. Now we're going to flip over to 2 Kings 23, verse 3. 2 Kings chapter 23, and verse 3. Again, you have to flip back and forth between these books to get the complete story. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 3 reads, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal, and for the grove, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. Bethel is that false center of religion that Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, had set up. Notice that even after all the work he had done earlier before the scrolls were found, they still have these little trinkets, these little goodies that were left over from the idolatrous times. I'll bet you they were beautiful ornaments that someone said, well, this is too beautiful to throw away. It's a real work of art. Let's take these into our house of the Lord and let's use these two, these goblets and these probably pretty uh, lampstands and things. Why, the Lord would appreciate works uh, like that. What Josiah did with them is he pulled them out and he beat them down to dust. And he carried the ashes right back up to probably where this stuff started in the northern kingdom, up to Bethel. Now again, Christians today, we don't do any of that kind of stuff, do we? Well, again, we change Passover to Easter. We teach about a false rapture. Those are two examples that come to mind. And at this time of the year, a couple more could come to mind, but I won't get into that. Now, just to make sure everybody gets home to read, uh, to uh, so don't burn your beans, uh, I'm going to skip over some of the next verses. Needless to say, what he does here, he goes out, and Josiah ain't happy of just taking down these idols. He breaks them up, stamps them into dust, takes the dust, scatters them all over and pollutes the old uh, uh, pagan uh, sanctuaries and altars, totally destroys them, doesn't mess around. When He also goes up north into uh, the, where the northern tribes used to be, and he finds all of those idolatrous priests up there, and he kills them, kills them dead, doesn't fool around with them. Now let's... Uh, Run down to uh, let's see Second Kings twenty three and verse fifteen. Going to skip down all the way down to there. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel, the high place which Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who had made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place. He broke down and burned the high place and stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. Now the what comes after this. Again, in the interest of time, we're going to skip over, but you might want to go back and take a side study on it. 
while jo remember Josiah, he's always right there. He just doesn't say go out and destroy these altars. He goes out there with his troops and he oversees these altars getting destroyed. So while he's up there in what used to be the northern kingdom, he's up there, he notices a sepulcher and he asks, well, what sepulcher is this? And someone said, well, that's the sepulcher of a prophet of God which actually foretold what you were going to do, Josiah. Remember we were talking about how young a kid could be before the Lord picks him out? Well, let's turn over just real quickly to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1. First Kings chapter 13, verse 1. If you can remember to keep your place in 2 Kings 23, that might be handy. If we're going to come back to it after just a couple of verses. First Kings chapter 13, verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God, and this prophet's name's not given, out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, that's a member in the northern kingdom, and Jeroboam, that's that first evil king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So he's standing there committing abominations. And he, that's the prophet of God, cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, remember Josiah's name, what it means in Hebrew, whom God heals, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. So 325 years approximately prior to Josiah's birth, he was named by name, his exact name. There's only one other person in the Bible that was named by an exact name, and uh, that was Cyrus over in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. So the Lord had plans for Josiah way before Josiah was ever even thought of and named him by name. And here Josiah is up doing the Lord's work and says, well, what's this sepulcher over here? And they said, well, that's the prophet that named you 300, over 300 years ago by name, that you would be up here doing exactly what you're doing. That prophet testified in front of Jeroboam. And now here you are casting the ashes of those who used to sacrifice on the altar up on their own altar. That's pretty powerful. Now, just to make sure get home in time for those beans. Uh, I just wanted to mention that there's, we really want to thank our Heavenly Father that today that He raises up strong men and women to carry out His will. And you know, we're in an age now where there's not a lot of strong men of the Word. There's getting to be fewer and fewer of them. And women have always been looked at as kind of the light keepers in the house. That's, we've said that in this country for a long, long time. And I think you'll find in Scripture that when there aren't strong men, when there are strong men of God, I think you'll find women playing those background roles a lot of times. But when those men get weak in the Word, I think you'll find the Lord raises up strong women every single time to whip them back in line. You saw that with Deborah. Remember Deborah? She didn't, uh, Barak, her, her commander of the army, he didn't want to go fight Caesarea unless Deborah came along. That's in direct violation of what the Lord had said. The Lord said, go out there and I'll give you the victory. And he said, well, I'm not so sure. Deborah, I know he likes you a lot. If you'll come along with me, you know, it'll be my good luck charm maybe. I don't know if he really meant that or not, but he certainly didn't want to go out there without Deborah. And she said, if you make me go, I'll go. But I'll tell you what, you won't have the victory. It will be, the victory will be in the hand of a woman. And Deborah watched Caesarea be routed, and another woman named Jael took old Caesarea in a tent, gave him some buttermilk and a tent peg, and killed his butt on the spot. So there ought to be a lesson to some of us men. We need to stay strong in the Word. The Lord's got a lot of women out there. And I think in the last days, as we read in Joel chapter 2, Men and women will prophesy. You read over in Romans, uh, in Galatians, that in Christ Jesus, there's no Jew or Greek. There's no male or female. We're all one in his body, thanks to his sacrifice. So anyone out there that likes to uh, pick on women, uh, well, 
Pastor Murray is a tough character to deal with. You probably don't want to mention that around him. We don't do that in, in God's family. We don't pick on anybody. And just before, I'll go over just a little bit more. I want you to read something really beautiful. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. That's the easiest thing to remember. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. After, you know, a lot of times it's easy to get depressed. You see how Israel goes right back to the vomit time and time again. We never seem to learn our lessons. We can look around today and it's easy to get depressed. You look around and go, oh my, all these people that call themselves Christians, look what they're doing. And sometimes we're like the prophet that thinks we're the only ones left. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I had made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and... I will remember their sin no more. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinance of the moon, and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea, and the waves thereon thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Now what a promise. And notice, too, he's saying to all of us today that when he forgives our iniquity, he, he forgets it. And I suppose when the Lord forgets something, it's forgotten. I wouldn't want to bring it back up to him. I wouldn't even want to bring it back to him at all. And again, if you'll study Pastor Murray's tape on forgiveness, you'll find the essence of, of that in that tape. It's just outstanding for us all. Okay, I think uh, hopefully you've learned a lot about a prophet that nobody ever much hears about. And if you really stop and think about it, you might be able to figure out, I didn't have time to go into it, you might be able to figure out how's come they named those, uh, uh, those uh, entrances, those arches, up to the Temple Mount after her. She had two of them made. They were there at the time of Jesus, and no doubt he went through those uh, ceremonial arches. And no doubt, no doubt they were made when you passed through that your mind would hearken back on that prophet of God holder. Pretty strong woman. Okay, let's end in a prayer from the Lord. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for being able to study Your Scriptures today. Make that word written in our heart. Let us not wander from You. And let us be like Josiah, that we don't defer to the left or to the right. May we always be straight for You. And in these times, may we study ever more so that we can be the best representative of you that we can possibly be. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua.